Are we educating for a world in which we understand but no longer exist? You see, we live in a world of unprecedented challenges. You've heard about many of these challenges today, challenges like climate change and fresh water security and even infectious disease and health. As I look at all of the challenges behind me, a couple of things come to mind immediately. The first is that all of these challenges are man-made. Not only are they man-made, but they're created by our generation and will impact future generations. The second is that they're population driven. You see, we have more than 7 billion people on the planet today. Over the next 10 years, we'll add a billion more. How do I know? We're making those billion as we speak. If I gave every one of those billion one light bulb, one 40 watt light bulb, and told them they can only burn it for four hours a day, we'd need a 500 megawatt power plant built every month for a period of two years just to meet that demand. Those seven billion people will put unprecedented stresses on our environment, and on our energy needs, and on the way we live our life. Nowhere is that more well known than here in the Southwest, where Lake Mead, the reservoir that supplies more than 40 million people with nourishing water is at levels that it hasn't been since its inception. This was all caused by the 15-year drought that's caused by the climate change that our generation has actually had a big part in causing. The American Society of Civil Engineers has conducted a study, and they do this every other year, where they look at our roads, our bridges, our aqueducts, our dams. And they look at these, and, and what they say is, we will produce a report card, an entity that outlines how well we're doing in these areas. In 2013, the last time this study was run, the country received a D plus for its infrastructure. It will cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $3.2 trillion to get our infrastructure up to par. Here in Southern California, it says that about one out of every three bridges and overpasses are structurally deficient or functionally obsolete. Let me break that down for you. It means they can't carry the loads in which they were designed to carry. So think about that on your way home. <laughs> Just count them out. One, two, three. Can this be the one? One, two, three. Can that be the one? Question, are we educating our students to solve the grand challenges of our generation? We not only have unprecedented challenges, but we have unprecedented global competitors. This is Singapore in 1965. This is Singapore today. This picture was taken from the same exact vantage point. You remember that old drugs commercial? This is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. Get the picture. You get the picture. A student graduating today will have far many more talented and well-educated competitors than we had when we graduated. They're not going to just be competing against students from MIT and Stanford and Yale and Harvard and the like. But they're going to be competing with students from IIT Madras, from Peking University, from Tokyo University oftentimes for the very same jobs in this country. Are we educating our students to be truly globally competitive? We also are dealing with unprecedented change. And as an engineer, I like to look at change as the time it takes for a specific technology to get to 50 million users. So it took radio 38 years, television 13, Cell phone seven, internet four, Facebook two. <laughs> Facebook has 1.4 billion monthly active users. China has 1.3 billion people. And the Chinese don't allow their citizens to have Facebook accounts. How many of you in here have Facebook? See by show of hands. 
Whoa, man. Okay, if I was Facebook, I'd be worried. Because when my students see this video and they see the hands of all their parents and adults go up, that 1.4 billion might be coming down. <laughs> what does all of this mean? Well, it means that more than half of the top 10 in-demand jobs in 2014 did not even exist in 2004. You see, Facebook became a company in 2007. How many in here have a smartphone? The modern day smartphone, the first one with the apps that we all know and love and can't live without anymore. The modern day smartphone was invented in 2007. So all of the jobs associated with that did not exist. None of the jobs associated with social networking existed before 2007. The jobs associated with apps, the jobs associated with the whole mobile internet revolution did not exist. Because even the basic terminology didn't exist. Wi-Fi was a misspelled word in 2007. In 2004, 4G was a parking spot out in the lot, 4G. He's in 4G. <laughs> Are we educating students for the job market of the future? I could take this one one step further. Are we educating students for the job market of today? You see, you hear all the time, there are 9.6 million unemployed in this country. What you don't often hear is that there are more than 3 million unfilled jobs at any given point in time. We have unprecedented opportunities. Look, in the next five years, you won't need IDs, money, credit cards, store cards, business cards, photos, mail, or the mailman, paper and hardback books, bills and notices. A actually, you can get rid of the bills and notices today. <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> no matter what happens, you might not get a paper bill, but the bill's not going anywhere. <laughs> paper, <coughs> steering wheels. You heard yesterday about a number of automotive companies that are bringing driverless uh, vehicles to the market. That is happening. That will be a reality. You'll have your first, uh, BMW will bring their first one to the market uh, uh, next year. GM is rolling out with theirs. In, in, in 2016, organ donors. Will we need organ donors? Right now, there are at least five universities in the country, including the one uh, that I oversee, the University of California, Irvine, that are producing artificial kidneys and artificial livers and artificial pancreases using the now defined technology of 3D printing. Many of those are in clinical trials. Classrooms, would we need them? Now, as I look at all of these technologies, I have to ask myself the basic question. How do you educate in a world where everything seems possible? You see, if you look at them all together and you say, wow, these, you know, we've gone through great heights and we've gone through it very, very quickly. You know, we're going to 50 million users in two years now where it took much longer time previously to do that. It looks like time is going faster. Every 18 months, every 18 months, the number of transistors that we can put on a chip doubles, which means the computational speed of those chips continue to double. And it's going to be that way all the way until 2022. But you have to start asking yourselves the question, with all of these changes, are we much better off? Could we be even better off? if we were educated just a little bit differently. You know, many of the technologies are in a single field with individuals who are working in that single field and developing in that single field. Meaning, uh, the Google Glass or a Fitbit or other devices are developed primarily by engineers. And there's some others that come around it, but it's technically in the purview of engineering. Most people who I know who wear Google Glasses tell me that they have issues when they're having interpersonal conversations with people when they have their Google Glasses on People don't know if they're being recorded. They don't know if the person's actually paying attention to them or whatever is on their glass. They have to take them off. What if a social scientist were actually 
intimately involved in the, design, in the design of these glasses. Look up the top there, you see a driverless vehicle. Great move in modern technology. But I will ask you the question, would you drive that car? <laughs> I wear a device that tracks my steps, my, my, my motion, tracks my sleeping at night, how well I sleep, and then it takes all that information and puts it on the web. One night I was going to bed, I had my device on, I get into bed, and, uh, and my wife says, what are you doing with that device? I said, it tracks my nighttime activity and posts it to the web. <laughs> she says, there'll be no nighttime activity if you wear that device. <laughs> <laughs> Is education changing fast enough? We know it's changing. With the advent of online education, with the advent of MOOCs, with the advent of uh, flipped classrooms and mobile internet technologies, we know education is changing, and it's changing dramatically. It has actually reached a tipping point. Every major university in the country is looking at or involved in or producing online content. But we're not talking about the nature of that content, and that's where the problem lies. You see, we're changing, but we're not changing at the pace of industry. Do you remember the manufacturing plants of old? They were, it was hard, backbreaking work in those manufacturing factories, right? But not only was it hard, backbreaking work, people often got injured. <laughs> Fast forward to the manufacturing plants of today. You have robots, and it's fully automated. Those manufacturing plants of today represent where we're going and where we are. I read a recent quote lately that said, the factory of the future would need two things, a man and a dog. You need the man to feed the dog. <laughs> you need the dog to keep the man from touching any of the robots. <laughs> Here's the kicker. Here's the point. Right now in this country, more than 47% of all of our current jobs are at risk due to computerization. You see, as a technologist, I am always asking the question, can I? I need the sociologists, I need the humanists, I need the others to answer and to ask the question, should I? Recently, the National Academies did a study and they say, <clears throat> here are all the attributes that a student must have in order to be successful in the year 2025. They must have strong analytical skills. They must be creative. They must have global communication skills, business management skills. They must be highly ethical. They must be able to take complex problems and understand those in their social, technical, and operational context. They said, we need a new type of education in order to do this. And I look at this and I'm like, that doesn't look like a very new education to me. Actually, Analytical, math, science, creativity, arts, humanity, communication, humanity, actually looks like something very old. Could these be Renaissance skills? Bear with an engineer for a minute as I give you my definition of the Renaissance. It's a global cultural movement beginning in the 11th century based on a resurgence and understanding of classical knowledge and ideas. It actually sprung forward from Northern Africa and the Arab world through Spain and through Italy throughout the rest of Europe. Renaissance people sought to develop their abilities in all areas of accomplishment, be it artistic, social, and physical. And what these people did is they used different pieces of different disciplines to solve the problems of their day. If I were to look out today and say who are modern Renaissance people, it'd be people who we call hackers and makers. They're the ones that are doing that kind of thing. So how do we move forward with this new Renaissance philosophy? How do we incorporate it today so that we can get better designs, better outcomes, better features? There are two paradigms, the revolutionary and the evolutionary. In a revolutionary paradigm, the first thing we do is get rid of majors. In a world where the solution to problems are found at the interface of disciplines, 
the major is too confining. And while we're at it, let's rethink the professor. Does the professor have to teach the way in which a professor taught 20 or 30 years ago with the advent of the internet? Seems like now the professor could be more of a coach and a facilitator than someone who's solely responsible for giving out the information. So students would just get one degree. And in that one degree, they get a general education that includes basic technology, the arts, and, and foreign languages. They would complete their degree with a capstone experience where they would have to solve a problem or propose a solution to a problem that was synonymous with a grand challenges. All of the coursework which they would choose would be learner-centric and not necessarily institutional-centric. Now, I'll tell you right now that this revolutionary framework is great, but I'm the dean of engineering. <laughs> and I can see what happens now. Yeah, we'll get rid of majors. Let's start with engineering. Get rid of that one. <laughs> Renaissance stat. <laughs> then there's the evolutionary paradigm. And in the evolutionary paradigm, we augment our current system through interdisciplinary degree programs, through student projects, and through living learning experiences. What this means is that engineers will get a little bit more of the humanities and foreign languages and that kind of thing. It means that humanists and artists will get a little bit more programming and technology. We'll have facilities in place where groups of individuals can come together and learn and study together. We call those facilities Edgenasiums. They come in with an idea, they can actually leave out with a prototype. And that can even be expanded to what are called innovation islands, where not only students from different majors can come together, but people from all walks of life. And not only can they come together and leave with a prototype, but they can actually come together and leave with a company. We call those concepts innovation islands. The professors and all of these entities would be coaches not just teachers. This is the kind of forward thinking that we are proposing. You see, why would an engineer, why would the dean of engineering be talking about a revival of the Renaissance and a revival of Renaissance teaching? My initial passion was actually in the humanities and history. When I dealt with my most difficult technical problems, it was John Coltrane who saved me. Just because you are a technologist and a scientist by vocation, it doesn't mean you can't have a fundamental understanding of the arts and literature. And just because you're an artist or a humanist by vocation, it doesn't mean you can't have a fundamental training and understanding of science and technology. In the end, we're going to need it all. We live in a time of unprecedented educational challenges. And these unprecedented challenges require unprecedented changes to our educational system. Thank you.